Amen. Well, well, thank you for being here on week number six. Technically, it's been seven weeks, but we took one Wednesday off for the 4th of July and week number six. So, uh, you know, I've, I always thank you, sir. Listen, in any organization, in any congregation, there is attrition that takes place. Um, however, um, this congregation has behaved quite well in the manner of attrition. And uh, um, there's a whole lot more on this subject. And I know it's also summer. And we're approaching the second to the last week before. No, no, we have how many more weeks until kids go back? Two weeks, three weeks. What do we got? Anybody? Parents aren't our parent. Every parent, every parent should know this because you can't wait for your child to go back to school. Um, <laughs> three weeks. I see two, and I see some say three. Um, I don't have kids in school anymore, so that doesn't apply to me. And uh, <laughs> and so, um, but it's it's we're approaching here the end, and next week is going to be fantastic because next week we're covering subjects that are really going to interest you a subject in particular which is called closing open doors as yes we'll be talking about music entertainment relationships we'll be talking about um well several things marriages We'll be talking about anger. We'll be talking about several things that I'm just going that, that, that we're covering in certain areas, and we're going to explain to you what an open door is and how what a true biblical biblical New Testament open door. All right, in the manner of spiritual warfare, it is so important that we have what we call a hermeneutical mindset where we have a, at least a, a rudimentary understanding of um, hermeneutics um, and how we interpret Scripture because the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament is called the cross of Christ. At the cross, Jesus perfected when he said, it is finished. He said the price is paid in full, and now we're now entering into a new covenant. And so you have to understand that a lot of spiritual warfare, deliverance ministry uh, sort of teaching, a lot of it, it's Old Testament that although it built a foundation, it's no longer needed because God has now walks with humanity. Y'all hearing me? Say yes, Pastor. Yes. Fake until you make it, y'all. Come on. God works with humanity, and God is in us. In the Old Testament, the Spirit of God came upon people for specific purposes. In the New Testament, the Spirit of God lives in us. We no longer have to go to a tabernacle or a temple. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. That's why we can have, we can now boldly approach the throne room in a time of grace. And you don't have to bring an animal so a, a, so a priest can, can kill it. And then, so the priest can go to the presence of God for you. No, 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 no. None of that anymore. We can boldly approach the throne room of grace in our time of need. Because Jesus completed the final work in Christ. Somebody say yes. yes. So now, therefore... That means that the enemy has already been defeated, and we are now demon slayers. Mm, getting quite Baptist in here today. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe we should go back to prayer again. Y'all hearing me? Yeah. All righty. And so I, 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 the, the whole philosophy, the whole meaning of why we're doing demon slayer is to reshift your understanding of what it means to do proper spiritual warfare so you could stand as a man and woman of God. Amen. Today, we're going to talk about the hierarchy of demons. So it, it can be, it's informational. Uh, next week, it's going to be fantastic, okay? Fantastic, and, and it's going to be more practical. Today, it's informational, so you've got to stay with me. Hierarchy of demons, there is a hierarchy. There is a, a system of, of, of the demonic, 
realm or the domain of darkness. And um, the, that system is, is, is quite complicated. We're going to go to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 19 through 23. Wherever you see bold and underlined, you come in with a... There we go. Let me take a little sip of water, though. Is that okay? Sorry. I also pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe him. This is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead and seated him in the heavenly, excuse me, and seated him in the place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. Now he is far above God has put all things under the authority of Christ and has made him head over all things for the benefit of the church. And the church is his body. It is made full and complete by Christ who fills all, who, who, who fills all things everywhere with himself. That's Ephesians. It's this, this week we get, Pastor Victoria and I get to travel to Europe and um, we're actually going to go to Turkey and visit the site of the Church of Ephesus. And that has been on my bucket list um, because the Church of Ephesus in the first century became the largest and the most powerful church in Christianity at that moment in time. And the, uh, and the, the latter part of his life, the Apostle John pastored the church for many years. And, um, and the Apostle Paul started it in a revival of, that lasted two and a half years. And throughout those years, he would write to them in the letter to the uh, church of Ephesus. It is the most, it's the deepest and the most complex out of all the epistles. Um, the, the, the letter of the, to the Ephesians has the most theology regarding the spiritual realms and the demonic realms. And, and, and God explained it all to the Apostle Paul. Uh, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12 says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against, 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 against. So the book of Ephesus, or the, excuse me, the, the book or the epistle to the Ephesian church clearly then distinguishes between what we call the heavenly realms where Jesus rules in the high places where demonic powers have dominion according to Ephesians chapter 6 or verse 12. And so Christ has the highest position as ruler of the heavenly realms. Okay? Now check out Ephesians, same epistle, chapter 2, verse 2, in which you once walked following the course of this world, following the... Of the, the following the what? The, of the, power the, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. You see, Satan possesses authority in a sub-heavenly realm, which is called the air. So don't, don't get all freaked out now, okay? But I also want to get practical with you. So in other words, Satan has influence on the earth. And to understand this fully, then we have to look at the very first verse of Scripture. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created in the earth. I should have just underlined the rest of it, right? In the beginning, God created... And the earth. So did it say heaven or does it say heavens? Ah, it is plural. Stay with me. So the wording in many Bible translations show that there is plurality to the heaven or to heaven. Right? In fact, the Apostle Paul tells us that there are at least three realms of the heavens. 
So now we're going to pull out of Ephesians and go into 2 Corinthians 12, 1 through 4, where the Apostle Paul dangled the carrot over me and gave us a little bit of information and then left it there. This boasting will do no good, but I must go on. I will reluctantly tell about visions and revelations from the Lord. Whether I was in my body or out of my body, I don't know. Only God knows. Yes, only God knows whether I was in my body or outside my body. He goes on to talk about the different revelation, everything. He, God showed him everything. He was actually taken up to paradise, and he was able to see heaven, hell, and everything else. I'm like, why didn't you keep telling us? And I believe the Lord keeps us at a place of curiosity and vagueness because us as humans, we tend to build a lot of doctrine and dogma around information that we really don't understand. So the Apostle Paul, God gave that to the Apostle Paul, and on top of that, he gave him, a, he allowed the messenger of Satan to attack him. Paul called it a thorn in the flesh. And Paul said, I prayed three times. Most of us pray like every week, twice a week, a hundred times. He said, I only pray three times. And the Lord kept telling him, in your weakness, I am made strong. Hmm. going on with that scripture it says but I do know what I was caught up caught up to paradise and heard things so astounding that there that they cannot be expressed in words things no human is allowed to tell so in scripture we're told about three heavens okay the first one is earth atmosphere or the sky and those are your scriptures if you want to take pictures of those you can look those up later I don't have time to read all those scriptures but they're there the second one is the cosmos, including the sun, moon, and stars, space, the final frontier. What was that? Oh, the first one was the earth, atmosphere, or the sky. You can always take the pictures. No, I don't want to take pictures. It's okay. And then the second one, are you good, Laura? Laura? Because Miss, Miss Robin is really, really quick, too. <laughs> the cosmos, including the sun, moon, and stars. That's the second heaven. And the third heaven is God's dwelling place. That's like heaven, heaven, heaven. And they're all called heavens. So this atmosphere here is the first heaven. It goes all the way up to what is the last sphere? Is it the ionosphere or is the stratosphere? Stratosphere. And then this, the second heaven is the ionosphere or space. And the third heaven is God's actually actual dwelling place. One is physical. Two. Number two can be both. And number three is spiritual. So Satan it's the prince of the power of the air, as in Earth's atmosphere. Earth's atmosphere. So here's an interesting side note to consider, and I'll check this out. And it could possibly could be poetic justice here, but, but, but the air over which Satan rules is the same air where the Lord Jesus will meet us in his triumphal triumphant return according to 1 Thessalonians 4:17 so satan might rule the air over us but truth be told jesus when he comes back he is going to crush him isn't that good amen yes pastor yeah whatever i'm trying to be as 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 i don't know illustrated as i can y'all good am i yeah 
Okay, maybe you're writing. Okay, that's what it is. Okay, so here's my point. There's a difference between Christ's sphere of influence, heavenly realms, and Satan's sphere, the air. Okay, there's a difference. For a time, Satan has some influence in the air or the realm of the earth. With this in mind, we have to look at Ephesians 6, 12. Once again, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Read it. Many of y'all, you've read that over and over and over again. You didn't even know what that meant. And particularly what we call high places. This is the air. In this verse, then we find that there are four aspects to the structure of demonic rule. Here they are. Principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness of this world, and spiritual wickedness in high places. So I don't want y'all to get freaked out, but I know many of y'all, when you ride on an airplane, you look outside, you go, how beautiful, and it is beautiful. But truth be told... It is really a demonic activity happening all through the air. But wherever you are, there's freedom. Amen. Wherever you are, there's freedom. And I don't mean to sound like boastful or arrogant, but, you know, when this happened one time only, I wish it could happen more, uh, this, this one person was, like, kind of nervous and uh, I was younger in ministry, and I heard a preacher say it, and I figured I, I repeat it. And we, they were in the plane, and they said, oh, I'm a little nervous, you know, I'm on the airplane. What if it crashes? And I said, it won't crash. They said, why? Because I'm in it. And God gave me a purpose and a promise, and it's not finished yet, so it's okay. Out there, up, up in the sky, folks, yes, that is the domain where demonic activity constantly flows throughout the earth, constantly. And later on, I'll get into some stuff that might freak you out a little bit. But, but, um, but when we're up there, it's peace because we carry the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Come on, somebody say yes. Yes. There are more demonic activity happening up in the sky than it is on the earth at the graveyards or in the place that you think is haunted. And I'm here to tell you there is no such thing as a haunted house. Just haunted people. And there's no such thing as haunted houses. Scripture does not, does not say one thing about haunted houses. But when tradition says that there's places that are haunted, and then you're told, and you're told all kinds of stories, we believe the lie, we empower the liar. Demons don't haunt places, they haunt, they don't habitate places, they habitate people. My professor, uh, uh, my evangelism professor in my, in, in my Bible school said that. Because uh, we were praying over a building. We were, we were doing street ministry. And um, there was a bar that we wanted to pray over to turn into a church. And, and, and we felt like we needed to lay hands on it and cast the devil out of the bar. Because there were, you know, it's a bar. And, uh, you know, he said, you know, you, you might need to pray that prayer over everybody's houses and people's tailgates and backyards. Because they drink in houses and tailgates and in backyards as well. And then he, the professor looked at me. He's a, a statesman, Dr. Elliot. He said, son, demons don't possess buildings. They possess people. You ain't got to pray over that building. Once you're there, the presence of God is there. And I went... We love superstitions, don't we? We fall prey to them. I've had people call me and say, Pastor, I need you to come pray over my house. To, to what? To bless my house. I'm sorry. And I said, I, I, and I, 
I go, Ugh. I have to go now into the whole theological thing. I'm, I'm not going to bless the house. I'm going to bless you. Bless you, but I won't bless the house. Oh, then pray over my house that everything, you know, that it doesn't break. Well, it's this thing called maintenance. Maintenance. Your water heater won't break if you make sure you take care of it. Because <laughs> the spirit of something is breaking my water heater. No, I'm going to cast out the spirit of laziness. But, all right, I'm, 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 I'm. <laughs> all right, we good? All right, can we talk about principalities? Principalities. So many people teach that a principality is a strong demon. It's not correct at all. Every principality is overseen by a strong demon, but principality itself, spiritually speaking, actually is actually a region under the control and influence of a demonic prince. All right? So the principality is the place, and the prince is the powerful demon in charge of it. That is a subtle distinction to be made, okay? So certain regions of the world, in example, cities, nations, ritual sites, can become demonically influenced, but it's important to note that demonic beings are not necessarily interesting in, interested in influencing places. Uh -uh. They are interested in influencing people. How many of you heard this? That burial ground is possessed. When people go to that burial ground, there's, because there was witchcraft that was done there, where in the Bible does it say that if witchcraft was done somewhere, that demons just kind of hang out and build condos to live in? No. But if we believe that to be, the reason why it might appear that there are more demonic activity in Port-au-Prince, Haiti, than there is in other places, has nothing to do with the physical location of Haiti. It has everything to do with the mindset and the belief and the practice of voodoo right. that creates the principality. If all the people who practice voodoo in Haiti moved to the Kula, guess what? This becomes a voodoo stronghold. Yeah. Has nothing to do with the country of Haiti. Are y'all breathing? Come on, people. So, so, so different places have them. Down here in the deep south, it's, there is a principality of racism. And it's not the place. Stone Mountain ain't possessed. Stone Mountain is not possessed. Fix, fixing, getting rid of the, the whatever's engraved, the, the three generals of the south of Stone Mountain isn't going to eliminate racism. Stone, it's not Stone Mountain. It's the mindset of the people in the area, and that is called a principality, and that is controlled by a prince demon. Demons gain influence over regions by gaining influence over people, not physical locations. I said that already, right? So in other words, demons don't exactly attach themselves to soil or to buildings or to rocks. If a demon can influence a person, it can affect everything that person impacts. So demons gain control over regions through varying degrees of influence over people. Y'all hearing me? So within these regions, principalities, regions, the demonic influence is heightened. It's heightened. And Satan, the prince of the power of the air, is the overall ruler of those regions. And he's got prince demons that rule in those regions. 
Come on, somebody. Satan rules these regions through his loyal, what we call prince demons. The strong demons that are assigned to and oversee principalities. Hence, we get principality like a municipality. A principality, it is a location ruled by a prince. Are y'all hearing me? We see an example of a demonic prince in the book of Daniel. Now, let's look. Daniel chapter 10, verse 13. But for 21 days... All right, let me read that again. So it's okay. So all right, y'all were taking notes, you know, checking your Facebook. I get it. All right, okay, Daniel 10, 13. I'm teasing. But for 21 days, read it. Then Michael, one of the archangels, came to me, and I left him there with the spirit prince of the kingdom of Persia. So while Jesus is the king of kings, Satan is the prince of princesses, princess, obviously a lesser ruler, okay? So to reiterate, though principalities can represent high-ranking demons, the word principality directly refers to prince demons, but to also the regions where they rule. So the principality is the region, and the prince is the overseer of that region, and ultimately Satan masters the princess demons. You got it? Let's go to powers, okay? So you got principalities, you have powers. Next, we see the word powers, and so in Ephesians 2, we are what we call context clued into its meaning, okay? Ephesians 2, verse 2 says in which you once walked according to the course of this world. Read it. The, the, the spirit who is now at work in the sense of disobedience. So Satan is the prince of the power of the air, not the prince and the power of the air. There's a difference there. I'll say that again. Satan is the prince of the power of the air, not the prince and the power of the air. Now, the power of the air isn't a title for Satan, and it isn't a person. Remember this. Satan rules over the power, so he himself cannot be the power. Let me explain what this is on the screen. The power is the entire system of the kingdom of hell. From, from, I may say it's government. Thus, hell is broken down into a basic chain of command. Power, and that power is organized into different regions, principalities. Got that? So it's like the government, the federal government, and its states. Got it. Got it? Good. Just as our government describes a complex system of people, places, and operations, power of the air describes the overall organized system of hell. Principalities, powers, rulers, and wickedness. Let's talk about rulers and wickedness. So further breaking down Ephesians 6.12, then we see the rulers of the darkness of this world, okay? The word rulers describe spiritual, personal beings. Uh-oh, it's getting creepy now. The rulers are demonic spirits, and the spiritual wickedness in high places is the collective of ranked demons, okay? So it's possible that fallen angels that remain unchained are among those high-ranking demons. Remember, not all the fallen angels had sex with the daughters of men to create the Nephilim. And the Nephilim, after they died, after the flood, created the demons. Remember I taught that? Not all the fallen angels, not all the fallen angels were judged according to the book of Jude which means there are 
rulers, fallen angels that don't affect people like demons, but they rule demons. Put it this way. The fallen angels are the fathers of the demons. And the demons were created because they had, the fallen angels had sex with the daughters of men. You guys are getting this? So they're ruled by their daddy. Which is absolutely disgusting and evil. So it's possible that fallen angels that remain unchained are among those higher ranking demons existing as spiritual wickedness in high places. And it could be that demons are the ground troops and fallen angels could be the air support. Now, the reason why I say it could be, because remember, I'm very literal. I give you scripture, but then sometimes scripture says scripture is silent, and then that's why I don't say this is that. I said this could be that. Remember, that, remember where scripture is silent, we don't shout. Y'all got it? So I'm going to give you some speculation here, some more speculation. Fallen angels existing in high places might also be the ones mistaken for aliens. Fallen angels existing in high places could also be ones mistaken for aliens. There are books written by people. Again, scripture is silent here. But there are books written by people who have studied this subject into also the apocrypha, pseudo-apocrypha, and whatnot. And, and they get into some really mystical stuff, but they talk about shapeshifters. And they've seen shapeshifters. And they see them in the power of the air, shifting. And when you have NASA reporting all sorts of weird metaphysical things happening and speculation again speculation i'm not teaching this as dogma or doctrine speculation just having a convo don't if you're going to quote me quote me right okay i can't believe my pastor said the demons are aliens and i didn't say that speculations okay it, that that these fallen angels shapeshift they're that powerful and Remember, an angel can transfer from the spirit realm into the, into the physical realm. They have that power that they still have awaiting judgment, okay? But they still have been removed from heaven, cast to the earth. Jesus comes to earth. Jesus opens the way to humanity. The curse has been reversed, but yet they are still here. Although defeated, they are still here with power to manipulate and to deceive. And if demons can get you to believe in aliens, then aliens, the thought of aliens can help make you believe that there is no God. Y'all good? So to recap, let's recap real quick. Principalities as regions, powers, the systems of hell, rulers of darkness of this world, demons, spiritual wickedness in high places, ranked demons, possibly fallen angels. Y'all good? Should we continue? If you got questions, write them down. Let's talk about demonic hierarchy now. From Ephesians 6, 12, we can conclude that the kingdom of darkness is organized into regions and it's systematized. So the book of Daniel tells us of spiritual warfare that took place in the high places. And this warfare hindered Daniel's prayer. What? Yes. Daniel 10 12 through 13, it says, he, then he said, don't be afraid, Daniel, since the first day you began to pray for understanding and to humble yourself before your God, your request has been heard in heaven. I have come in answer to your prayer. (laughs) 
Then Michael, one of the archangels, came to help me, and I left him there with the spirit prince of the kingdom of Persia. Now, there's a lot to unpack here. Immediately, the theologians of this group would ask, post, post-cross or pre-cross? How does this affect us now? How does this train of thought affect us now after the cross of Christ? I believe now, we can, since we can boldly approach the throne room of grace in our time of need, I believe this does no longer apply to the believer. I don't believe that because we can now approach the throne room of grace and Holy Spirit is within us and we, we, we groan and we travail and we call things that are not as though they were, I, this doesn't apply to us now. However, there is a hierarchy of how things can happen. Now, again, I'm giving you, once again, my interpretation and, um, um, and speculation regarding the scripture. But let me, let's continue. The spirit prince of Persia was a demonic being who had been assigned as the head of that region. And remember that prince demons represent principalities. Remember that, right? Prince demons can themselves be called spiritual wickedness in high places. So we know that high-ranking demons are given assignments over larger regions. So it's not a far stretch to then believe that demonic powers and principalities are further broken down by region and by rank. Then this means that there is a comprehensive system of ranking, starting with Satan and going down to the lowest demons. Let's talk Mark chapter 9. The disciples were confronted by a demon that was so strong for them to cast out of a, of, of a little boy. And the boy was tormented by this demon. And the boy's father looked to Jesus for answers. We're going to read. Stay with me. Mark 9, verse 20 to 29. So they brought him when the spirit saw, spirit, small s, okay, the demon, when the spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. He fell to the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked the boy's father, how long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered. It, is often, it has often thrown him into the fire or water to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. Verse 23, if you can, if you can, Jesus asked, everything is possible for one who believes. Immediately the boy said, Father exclaimed, I do believe, help me overcome my unbelief. That's another sermon for another time. Verse 25 says, when Jesus saw that a crowd was running to the scene, he rebuked the impure spirit. You deaf and mute spirit, he said. I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. Verse 26, the spirit shrieked, convulsed him violently and came out. The boy looked so much like a corpse that many said, he's dead. But Jesus took pity, excuse me, excuse me, but Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him to his feet and he stood up. Verse 28, after Jesus had gone indoors, his disciples asked him privately, bruh, <laughs> why couldn't we drive him out? He replied, this kind can. Now, some of you think, well, I thought it was prayer and fasting. Has anybody ever read that? Did you know that King James and a couple more that are very King James friendly, have prayer and fasting 
But the King James used manuscripts that were 600 years older than the Codex earliest manuscripts that we have today. The earlier manuscripts never said anything about fasting. Because remember, Jesus told the disciples, you don't need to fast because the bridegroom is with you. You only fast when the bridegroom is gone. The, the actual, now it's, it's, it's either or because there's nothing wrong with fasting. We all need to fast. But this comes out only by prayer. So at this point, the moment Jesus approached the demon-possessed boy, the demonic being began to act really in a childish manner, causing the boy to convulse. He would say, oh, I know what that is. That's a seizure. Possibly. But it doesn't mean that all seizures are demons. We as Christians love, we have, we have such a bent to always say this is that. We'll talk about that later. And so as Jesus saw the crowd of onlookers begin to grow, he exercises authority over the demon, causing it to come out. And the boy was free. The demon wanted to demonstrate his power for everybody to see. Never give a demon coming out of a person a platform. Take them to another room or do it immediately. But don't do a show. The devil loves a show. Later in private, the disciples approached Jesus and asked him why couldn't they cast out the demon? And Jesus actually tells them this. This kind can be cast out only by prayer. Other times, Jesus will cast out demons with a simple command, like in Matthew 8, 16. But the one from the story in Mark 9 that I just read could only come out by prayer. What? So this shows us that not only was the demon more powerful than other demons, but it was also a different kind. Dun, dun, dun. I need to have a button that can hit that theme music. It's a different kind, more powerful. We have to discern what we're dealing with here. Pray fast, I don't care, but it comes out through fast, through prayer. So within the organization of the kingdom of darkness, there are various kinds of levels of demonic beings. And yes, some require a little bit more amperage. Jesus was always amped because he was always praying. Y'all with me? Y'all good? Y'all running out? Of, I'm almost done. I'm almost done. Stay with me. Now let's, let's quickly go to Matthew 12. 43 to 45, when an impure spirit comes out of a person, it goes through arid places seeking rest and does not find it. Then it says, I will return to the house I left. When it arrives, it finds the house unoccupied, swept clean, and put in order. Then it goes and... Woo, more wicked. And they go in and live there. Holy smokies. And the final condition of that person is worse than the first. That is how it will be with this wicked generation. Loud. See, we see in that passage that a demon will gather unto itself seven other demons that are more wicked or evil than itself. You see how there's levels? Okay? You're seeing it, right? It's, it's there the whole time. So... Not only are demonic beings ranked by power and categorized by kind, but they have 
they also have different levels of wickedness. Disgusting. So the Bible doesn't exactly detail how these categories and ranks are applied to real life spirituality. It doesn't. I wish it did, but it doesn't. The Holy Spirit knew what he was doing. He knew what he was doing because we would probably create another denomination based upon believing what kind of categorizations we have of demons. But the Bible does make mention of varying kinds, varying kinds of demonic beings that function in various capacities. Like number one, seducing spirits. Dun, dun, dun. Seducing spirits. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. I'm not going to read it, but it's there as for you to read later. These are demonic spirits that seduce people away from faith in Christ by means of demonic doctrines. Islam, Buddhism, atheism, Mormonism, JWs. Should I continue? A little demon can't do all that. A prince of a principality can do that. And if you notice how these areas are subject. So, for example, some of you have common sense. What in Utah, what principality is there? Mormonism. Mormonism. A seducing spirit led by a prince demon in that area. You see how geographical locations play a part? You see that, right? Y'all see it? China. Yeah. And a bunch of other different kinds. India. Yeah. There you go. You're getting it. So areas. Areas. Okay. You're getting this, right? That's called, those are called seducing spirits. They seduce you, not sexually. They lure you into their false doctrine. Hosea calls this kind of demon a spirit of whoredom. Spirit of whoredom. Hosea 4, 5, 4. That's a seducing spirit. It leads you astray. In short, seducing spirits, they major in idolatry. All righty. Shall I give you the second one? Spirit of infirmity. Luke 13, 11. These demonic spirits attack the body and cause sickness. Now, I'm referencing here, I'm referencing here sickness that is on you and there is no explanation why you're sick. I'm not referencing sickness that happens because of an open door. An open door is a sickness that we reaped because we sowed. Now, let's just, I'm just going to throw it out there because, hey, listen, if you're going to drink and keep drinking and keep drinking and keep drinking, and for some reason you get, you get cirrhosis of the liver, don't be coming up to the altar to cast the demon of cirrhosis of the liver out. Nope. Not going to happen. Now, there are situations that to me it baffles my mind, and I know it's demonic. When there is a sickness that doctors don't know what it is, and there is this sickness on these people, on people, and they are, they've done everything that they can on their end, and it's still there, that's when we need to get serious, and we need to pray that there is no spirit of infirmity over people. And that they ain't possessed, they're just being attacked through sickness. Okay? So it's important to know that not, not, not all sickness is directly caused by demonic beings. For example, 1 Timothy 5.23, the Apostle Paul does not mention demonic beings, uh, uh, de demons' involvement when he counsels Timothy to take a little drink of wine for his stomach problems. Okay? Some of y'all should 
say hallelujah, that is a one on the positive column for wine. <laughs> Let me give you another one, number three. Miracle working spirits. Uh-oh. Revelation 16, 14. Yep. These are demonic spirits that perform miraculous acts in order to persuade people against the truth. And in the last days, we're going to see more and more of this. Now, I don't know if any of y'all follow David Blaine or follow, what's the other guy now? It's another guy that, Chris Angel. There's another guy. Listen to Chris Angel, David Blaine, some of these guys. Listen, when I saw David Blaine walking from one skyscraper to the next and walking on air, I'm like, okay, I know this is illusion. has to be an illusion, but if there's no illusion... When Deion Sanders was at the Dallas Cowboy locker room and, and David Blaine was in the locker room, he was doing card tricks and stuff, Deion Sanders was looking, and they had, this is perfect because the you know, camera guy was following him. You know, Deion Sanders, you know, is a believer, but, you know, you're a believer in the South and you see weird things, you're going to run. That's Dion, you know. And so he was in the locker room, and David Blaine said, you know, enough, enough, you know how he talks very mysterious like this. Enough of these card games. Here's one. I'm going to float in the air. And the camera's showing him. He's right there in the middle of the locker room. No strings, no nothing. He does this number. And he goes, <laughs> this and he floats and levitates up in the air. The next scene was the cameraman chasing Deion Sanders. He's running. He's going, no, 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 running away. But prior to that, every time David Blaine would do that, he'll vomit. And I figured I would vomit if a demon grabbed a hold of me and lifted me up. I'd probably vomit too. That's exactly what David Blaine did. He vomited after he levitated. What is that? It's, it's Revelation 16, 14. Miracle working spirits. They work miracles to seduce people. Oh, what's the actress that, that you know, the Hunger Games actress, what's her name? Jennifer Lawrence. Jennifer, I remember David Blaine did something really freaky. And she goes, wow, she screams. And then she looks at him and said, whatever religion you belong to, I am following your religion. If you are a religion, I follow you. And I went, yes. So those are not little, little frail anorexic demons, people. These are some powerful demons. All right, number four, spirit of div divination. Acts 16, 16. These demonic spirits influence through the occult. Oh, yeah, they prophesy. They don't tell the future. They predict the future. But if you believe their future, you live out their prediction. They're behind psychics. Necromancy, New Age mysticism, manipulation, bitterness. What? Wait a minute. If you're in church and you're bitter and you're offended and you are um, wanting to control a situation, you're falling prey to a spirit of divination. Spirit of divination probably works easier in a church than it does out in the street. It's getting quiet, y'all. Y'all get uh, y'all get Presbyterian on me, um, and so spirit of divination. And so, guys, I have seen doing street ministry a demoniac pray in demon tongues and prophesy. One demoniac looked at me and said, "I'm gonna kill your firstborn." Then spits like a snake. Then he looks at my friend that was with me. He was on staff with me in church. And he said, he already has a kid, but his wife was pregnant. Then he goes, I'm going to kill your. 
your second born. <laughs> they hits the ground and slithers like a snake. What happened? In the name of Jesus. Well, we got on top of that demoniac and started praying. So young in the faith, it took five hours. We should have took five minutes. But a couple, a few, a few things happened. That. Um, <laughs> so, anyways, um, it's eight thirty-one. I'm hurrying. I'm following. I'm closing right now. And the uh, last one is the devourer. The devourer. It's Malachi three eleven. When we tithe. The Lord rebukes the devourer. What? Yes, your tithe can set you free from the spirit of the devourer. This is a demonic spirit or possibly spirits that cause loss of financial increase and other resources. These, remember, when we don't follow kingdom principles, we open a door for the enemy to manipulate. These demons are assigned specific, specific tasks, specific missions throughout principalities, okay? But their organization goes beyond their categorization. And that's all I have for today. Any questions? Okay, I need my question, people. If you got a question, lift it up in the air. Like you raise your hand like you just don't care. I don't really need this microphone, but... Uh, yes, we have, for the recording. Oh. For people, yes. Would you say that homosexuality is a spirit of infirmity? Infirmity? I think it's a spirit. It's, it's a seducing spirit. Um, yes. Uh, it could be infirmity, but I don't believe infirmity more. Um, it's a it's a seducing spirit. It's um, and okay. Now, I need you. I want, I want us to be straight here. Okay. I don't believe if a person has a bent toward homosexuality that they are possessed. No, and I don't believe in the same way that it's actually demonic. It's 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 no. It's a sin. The same as exaggerating, same as um, um, dirty, a dirty mouth or fa bearing false witness, uh, the same as a person sees a man, hypothetically sees a woman and goes, oh my goodness, and then you have a thought of how it could be with that person in bed, it's the same Situation. It is a perversion. However, their mind is now wired through this. A perversion is wired to lust after the same sex. Now, do I believe that it can be demonically enhanced? Yes. Enhanced. Now, remember, homosexual, same-sex attraction can be there. And a lot of times it happens through abuse, happens through not just emotional abuse, verbal abuse, sexual abuse, the disorient, disorientation of the nuclear family, and particularly uh, uh, when children are little, and there is a rewiring that happens, or an abuse that happens, and it rewires the minds and the mind, and then it leaves room for demonic activity to come unchecked. And left the door left open to the believer, it becomes almost impossible to overcome. However, it doesn't mean that you're possessed by a demon. It doesn't mean that there is some some um, angelic, uh, 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 what's that called, fallen angel, you know, possessing this person because they they are, have same sex attraction. No, it's just like any sin. We have a tendency of taking homosexuality or lesbianism or, a, or the LGBTQ, LMNOP, QRS, TUV, WXYZ, all the other, all the letters, and thinking that that's some kind of demon. No, it's just a perversion. Just a perversion. I literally had a pastor was talking to me about a person in their church, a deacon. 
that went gay on him and started seeing another man. And he approached the guy and said, hey, man, if you're going to sin, sin right. He said, if you're going to sin, sin right. So in other words, if you're going to sin, at least commit adultery with another woman, not with another guy. That has to be the dumbest, the most foolish way of thinking. So we want to elevate homosexuality. No, it's just like any other sin. However, left unchecked, demonic influences can cause that to really, really, really become a major stronghold in the lives of people, which then they do need to be delivered from. But that deliverance doesn't happen when they spit in a bucket and they get prayed for at the altar. That happens when every day they cleanse their mind with the watering of God's word and they are then set free. I pray you can understand me. Can you understand me? Yes. Okay. You talked about seducing spirits. I don't know if this is a side conversation or not, but you talked about um, China and Utah. About Utah, you talked about a woman. Can you talk more about that? Because I'm like... A Mormon. Oh, Mormon. Oh, there's a woman. Yeah, that's okay. Mormonism. Mormonism. Mormonism is primarily centered, the headquarters of Mormonism is in uh, Utah and Salt Lake City. And so hence, it's uh, easy then to understand that a principality, the location ruled by a prince demon is over that area. Of course, there's Mormons everywhere, but that's a stronghold, okay? Uh, Islam in Mecca, shall we continue? You got it, right? Yes. Eric, you had something? I did. You did? You still do? I still Ye do. Yes, sir. I got plenty. Okay. Are ghosts Ghost. real? Are ghosts real? It depends. Demons are real. So demons can disguise themselves as ghosts. So but they're not can... people. So you can... It okay. depends what you mean by ghost, because if, you th if people think a ghost is a person that used to be dead, excuse me, that used to be alive, they're roaming around. Scripture to say, when you're absent from this body, you're either in two places, present with the Lord, or in weeping, or gnashing your teeth, or in the place of holding until judgment. And so humans don't wander the earth. Scripture does not say anything about that. So when we see weird things happening, those are demonic manifestations that occur to display themselves to be people. Hence, we have all sorts of religions, all sorts of seances, ancestral worship. Uh, my uncle appeared, my aunt appeared. All this appeared. Same thing would happen with Saul. That wasn't Saul. That was a demon because a witch conjured him up. That was a demon to conjure up Saul, excuse me, Samuel, for Saul to see him. And so there is no such thing as human ghost. If you see a ghost and that used to be your grandfather, just know your grandfather wasn't your grandfather. That was a demon. Okay, so let me make sure I got this straight. Because I thought you mentioned that demons can't take on a form. Only angels can take on a form. So the reason why I brought this up was because when Jesus was walking on the water, the disciples said, it's a ghost. Sure. So I'm thinking, how would they know what a ghost looked like? Because. Unless they'd seen a ghost before. No. Have you seen a ghost? No. So, only on TV and so, so, movies. So, so how do you know how the ghost... So how do you know that ghosts exist? What will make you think that a ghost exists? If a, if a uh, tradition or a myth was talked about, then you, your imagination connects with it, and you must say that's a ghost. Okay. You get my point? I do. Demons, demons don't manifest themselves. What I mean by demons, you also remember that fallen angels are demons as well. Mm-hmm. 
Fallen angels have the ability to manifest themselves physically. Mm -hmm. Demons make a lot of noise. They make okay. noise. Okay. And primarily through people, but you could hear demonic shrieks. I have heard them. Yeah. I don't know how they do it, but they do it. So I mean, I've never seen, I've never seen an actual demon manifest itself unless I saw it prophetically. But like a physical manifestation of somebody walking, dot, 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 dot. I, I saw one on the corner of my eye after a prayer meeting. And we all saw it. We all identified the clothes it was wearing. But it disappeared immediately. What was it? Well, it could have been a demon. It could have been a fallen angel. It could have been a prince. I, I don't know. Other than... I do know fallen angels have that ability to shape shift and manifest themselves physically. So if you saw one of them, take a picture <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and post it. <laughs> I'll let, I'll let somebody else. I got one. Sure. Okay, so in Mark, after Jesus had gone indoors, his disciple asked him privately, why could we have drived it out? And he replied, this, comes, this came out only by prayer. So would I be right in saying, no prayer life, no power? Yeah, absolutely. Amen for that, for sure. Completely yes, for sure. There are some demonic entities that require lots of prayer. And what is prayer? Remember this. It's not that God's saying, well, I can't hear you a little louder. No, 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 no. Prayer eliminates us. That's why I have no problem with the later translation of prayer and fasting. I don't have that problem either because in the 16th century, that was during the, that was during the era of what we call the monk eras. Pastor Victoria and I, we were in Greece where we had visited uh, monasteries up in the mountains. There were high mountains and these monasteries were everywhere because during that time in the 14th, 15th, and 16th century, for 300 years, monks set themselves up there to pray and to fast and to copy scripture, and, and just preserve the Bible. They added fasting on there because they prayed and fasted constantly and interceded for the church throughout the dark ages. However, and so, yes, prayer, yes, fasting. We need more proximity to God through prayer, less of us, more of him, in order to overcome that demonic entity on the earth. Yes. Oh, um, so post-cross, with the spiritual tools that we have now, is it actually possible to remove or spiritually battle a principality, for lack of a better word, out of an area so that we could clear an area of something like racial oh, discrimination? Or yes. is our battle literally with bringing the people to Christ and lessening the power? Y yes, to all the above. So, all right, so the reason why we pray it out is we have to clean it, but we got to get the Spirit of God into people. Salvation. Remember, the whole principle works. We cast a demon is cast out. He roams around looking for arid places. And, and when he leaves and he comes back, and the place is nice and swept and clean and put in order, but if it's empty, it comes back seven times harder. So the way it works is this way. Good question. And so, yes, we have to do spiritual warfare. Yes, but we have to preach the gospel. We pray first and preach the gospel second. That's why in every major revival, and particularly it happened in South America with Carlos Anacondia, and, um, where he would have, and um, um, the guy from Africa, uh, evangelist, um, help me, Reinhard Bunke. They, before they would have crusades, they would have hundreds if not thousands of intercessors continually praying and praying and fasting and praying. And when he would come to present the gospel, he would have miracles and signs and wonders. Why? Demonic influences had to shift out and it opened up the minds for people to receive the gospel. Amen. And so that's how it works. But you know why it doesn't happen in cities? Because churches can't even get along with each other. We spend so much time, I, I, guys, not you guys, because you guys are like my, 
You're like my, my babies, okay? Not with you guys. But I'm going to let you know. Do you know how much work it takes just to keep Discover Life Church from not backstabbing each other? I, we're trying to re, oh, we reach a city. I'm trying to keep what I have. It's, I, I'm going to say it, it's just stupid. It's just, it's stupid. How, the silliness that happens. Why can't we just love each other? Have fun with each other. Pray for each other. Have compassion for each other. And then when we come and pray, we're praying. Do you know how long it takes to get this prayer team, this prayer meeting, to just pray so we can see the heaven? We're basically doing maintenance most of the time. And we're barely scratching the surface in spiritual warfare. Oh, yes. I read in 1 John 4 where it's talking about testing to the spirits. And my question is, how can you tell if a demon is talking to you? And how do you know if, if it's actually God? Well, one thing you have, it's important that every one of you ask the Lord for the gift of discerning of spirits. Discerning of spirits, small s. Okay? That is a gift in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 where you have, it doesn't say discernment, it's the gift of discernment of spirits so that you know whatever it's, it's speaking to you, you know whether it's of God or not. Here recently I had, I had well not recently, but a little while back, a little while back, we, I had somebody say, well, I feel like I need to leave the church. Why? Because I got a vision. What? Yeah, I got a vision of a manta ray. In my prayer time, I said, yeah? Huh? Yeah. So then I Googled it, and somewhere in Google, buried under a whole bunch of weird stuff, said that a manta ray means to move forward. And so therefore, I feel like I need to move forward. And by me moving forward, I feel like I need to leave this church uproot myself, but I don't know where I'm going. I want to get this thing right here and pop them upside the head. I said, from what dumb tree did you fall from and hit every branch on the way down? But that's called not having discernment of spirits. Because six months prior, God told him something else. Oh, this is my church. This is this. This is that. So apparently God is schizophrenic. He changes his mind all the time. Discerning of spirits basically means is be careful what you're listening to. That's why when you listen to something, get wise counsel around you. Make sure, first of all, it's biblical. And don't be led by the prophetic interpretation of Google. I've never seen so much stupidity in my life. Sorry. Yes. Okay. Um, so I know you said that there are seducing spirits like by themselves, but you have the miracle working spirits whose ultimate goal is to seduce people away. And then you have um, the spirits of divination, which ultimately they're trying to seduce. So would a demon's purpose be to seduce people away from following oh, God yes. in general? It's lies. God is wrong. You're right. It's about your viewpoint. Love your truth. Deception. You are the center of the universe. He uses the same trick as the serpent did in Genesis. None of it changes. And so when you, it's about you and your feelings and your truth, it seduces you to take your focus off of Jesus and into yourself. And demons love doing that. The demonic realm, the demonic hierarchy loves doing that. That's why 2 Corinthians chapter 9 Chapter 10, it's talking about to take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ and be ready to punish every act of disobedience. Um, 
because the thoughts that come into our minds, they have to be crucified and make them obedient to Christ because any, if they're not, then they will elevate you. And the enemy doesn't have to present itself like an evil yeah, monster as long as he's seducing you away from Jesus. That's the main objective of the enemy. Absolutely. Yes, sir. Now, I, heard, I heard you speak on um, princes of the air. I just want to get your input on, um, I found a piece of paper a while back and it said, the prince of peace is here. Pray honestly and read your Bible. I just want to get your thoughts on that. Yeah, the prince of peace is the name given to Jesus. So he is the prince of peace, another title given to Christ. The prince of the power of the air is given to um, princes or prince spirits over principalities. And so, yes, when you, when, whenever you will read that paper, the prince of peace is here. He's the Alpha and the Omega, the Prince of Peace, da -da 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 -da, given um, in the book of Isaiah. And so, mighty God, my everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And so, that was the prophecy given in Isaiah chapter 6, 9, 8, 9, and um, referencing the Messiah. He is the Prince of Peace. However, that's the Messiah. The Prince of the Power of the Air, the reason why they call him Prince Demons is because a like a municipality, a principality is a region that's ruled by a prince demon. So prince of peace is Jesus himself. Awesome. What's your name, sir? I'm oh, sorry? Delante. Delante, good to have you. Visiting for the first, first time? Yes, first time. Come on, y'all. Yeah. Anybody else? Yes. Can you explain what spirits of divinations is again? Because I don't understand. Spirit of divination is um, witchcraft. Um, somebody want to help her? Y'all took notes. Spirit of divination. Anybody want to help her? False prophecy. Ooh, that's a big one. Um, um, Ooh. Influence through the occult. Psychics. Necromancy, New Age mediums, tarot card readers, Christian, ooh, Christian science, yes. Manip here's one, ready? Ready? Manipulation and bitterness. What? What? Yes, all that is. It's, it's called witchcraft, manipulation, control. Yes, Alani. So there's the, when the Pharisees came to Jesus and s accused him of healing people with the powers of the Prince of Air and all that, uh -huh. he said that a house divided amongst itself cannot stand. Uh -huh. So with the spirits, the miracle working spirits, the miracles are never like, oh, we're going to heal this person in the name of Jesus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's always me, myself, I'm going to heal this person because I'm so awesome. That's how they would work. Well, actually, believe it or not, there has been instances, whether it's through psychosomatic or through demonic powers, that people's body do get healed in particularly religions like Santeria. And it is a, just because the person got healed, if that healing caused that person to pull away from God and, and into the belief that saints, all kinds of Catholic saints, that, anyways, witchcraft, people get healed. Now, a question has been asked, but was it a true healing? Well, if the sickness ain't there, if the bone, if, if the pain is gone, if the disease is gone, it's a healing. But just because it's a healing doesn't necessarily mean it's of God. Demonic influences, powers also heal people. But once it heals, it's got you. It's got you. Yes. And so, so it's not that evil is casting out evil. No, it's evil still creating evil, even though that evil appears to be good by healing. 
what good is it if your body's healed if your soul's going to hell? Like money. Money. What would profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Which actually means it is possible for a man to gain the whole world. What good is it if you're going to go to hell? Um, do you want to go over there first? No? Okay. Um, so it makes sense in the beginning you were talking about the demonic doesn't possess a, a, a building, okay. right? But we often, on the flip side, will bless a building. And I've done that many times. Um, so in, you know, I, I Googled um, scripture real quick to look, I know, sorry. Um, but it's in like Exodus, anoint the doorpost. Sure, it's in sure. Deuteronomy, put it on the doorpost, talking mm-hmm. about the, the blessing. But nothing really in the New Testament. Sure. So because we have Jesus Christ in us and we, we don't need him to bless a physical sure. space, does he, when we pray those prayers, is he just like, oh, I'll look bless at them. Aren't, aren't, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, <laughs> does it do any good? Can you like, remember, <laughs> in the book of Deuteronomy, it had nothing to do with the doorpost. It, it was a symbolic act that you had to do physically to, to receive a spiritual meaning. So what represents the, the doorpost of a home? Anybody? It's what comes in and comes out. It's the gate of the home. You're, you're blessing your going ins and in your going outs. So the doorpost represents the very entrance or the gate of your home. So in the Old Testament, shadows and types were given for in the New Testament to give us meaning in the New Testament. So that was done in the Old Testament physically, nothing to do with the house, whether it was a brick house, metal house, clay house, it didn't matter. It was a spiritual significance for them that they would do something physically symbolic to attain a spiritual meaning from it. You get my point? So in my case, I anoint my family every day, but I don't have to drop oil on them or anoint my house, none of that stuff. I speak God's word over Callista, Zane, Zion, Zealand, and Erica. I speak the word of God over them, and I bless them as the authority of my household. I speak the word of God over them. That's basically the same thing as the blood put on the doorpost, dropping oil, and doing all these ritual things. You get my point? And so, so in, the, in the New Testament, it's spiritual, and the Old Testament is natural. That's what the Apostle Paul would say, first the natural and then the spiritual. Jesus completed the natural through the death on the cross. And after the death on the cross, everything is spiritual. So if you've blessed the home, if you listen, feel free. Whatever you got to do to do it, go for it. Just remember, there's nothing wrong with the house. It's the people who live in the house. It's what you do in the house that opens doors. Remember that, okay? All right. Praise the Lord. When it comes to Daniel's uh, fast of 21 days, how do you respond to people who believe that that's... I I know we're we're getting into this whole Bible descriptive and prescriptive type of Mm -hmm. thing, but so how do you respond to people who believe that the Daniel 21 day fast is something prescribed for Christians and should we even do that being that he shouldn't have had to fast for 21 days or was there something (laughs) Daniel was supposed to have done or he lacked doing that it took 21 days sure well folks all right you're talking to a very to a person here that I am the furthest from legalistic in anything, okay? Because I just think it's so funny how people, I'm a literist when it comes to God's word, but not a literist fundamentalist where I believe, where Jesus said, I am the gate, that I actually believe that Jesus is an actual gate. Like what gate, what kind of gate? Wood gate, metal gate, okay? So, so, Daniel's, I laugh at Daniel's 21 day fast. Now, granted, I think it's a cleansing. 
it's, I think it's good physically. I think we all should do it. it to me, it's harder to fast. Daniel's fasting than this. Now, I'd rather not eat. Because when I start eating and I'm not eating a steak my, or sugar, the devil is a liar. Anyways, my point is, my point is, there's nothing spiritual about it. The only way is spiritual if the Holy Spirit leads you to do it. So we get caught up in legalistic things. Oh, this is what you got to do. You got to do this. And oh my gosh. Listen, I've had, listen, let me tell you why we stopped doing prayer and fasting, fasting the first 21 days of the year. I just stopped doing it. It becomes so silly. It, because first of all, 99% of the people never make it. And then, and about 80% of them start to uh, uh, negotiate with God. Well, I did this, I did this, I did this. And by then, you're no better than a Catholic or anybody else that you feel like, you, or a Muslim that you have to pray facing Mecca three times a day. It becomes rich, it's a pharisaical, ritualistic, I just got to get it done, my God. I just stopped doing it. I'm like, why, why the first 21 days of the year? Why can't we do it all throughout the whole year? Why can't we live a fasted life? Why can't we pray continually, as the Apostle Paul said? So my point here is, if the Spirit of God leads you to do it, do it. If you fail, then ask the Lord for grace and mercy and keep trying it. But as to Daniel's fast, God told that to Daniel. He didn't prescribe that to us. Nowhere in the Bible does it say, for Daniel did this as a type and a shadow for the children of Israel to do. No, no. We just do it because we don't like fasting all the way. At least we get to eat fruits and veggies. Was there something else that he could do? Who, Daniel? Daniel. Daniel did what God told him to do. So there's, 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 there's testimonies of people, of revivals that occur because people did things, weird things that God told them to do. Evan Roberts in the Wells Revival that did things that he would do. Uh, uh, oh, God, I forget her name. Uh, this one lady, she carried a chair around every day for 21 days because God told her, don't let the chair, don't drop the chair. Go to sleep with the chair, walk around. Mary Woodward Edder. And she did that out of strict obedience to the Lord. And it was through her obedience that a move of God and revival happened. We can't get what God tells us to do and prescribe it. Oh, that's what we got to do. No. That's what God told him. Ezekiel laid on his side for how long? Me, for, for a long time. Because God told him to do it. God didn't tell me to lay on my side for a long time or not bathe or or what all that kind of stuff and so we get into some weird stuff i believe in fasting i believe we should fast but i believe more in the isaiah fast see and i say oh food 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 no the isaiah fast is feed the hunger the hungry clothe the naked take care of the widows and orphans but we all, hallelujah. Ooh, I, I pushed away my plate. I only ate half of it. But I pushed away my plate. Or somebody wants, somebody believing God for a miracle so they don't eat breakfast that day. They fast. God don't care about your breakfast. Eat away. Just because you ate, didn't eat breakfast, God says, oh my goodness, they didn't eat breakfast. I'm, gonna, I'm going to now give them what they want. And that's the most silliest and dumbest thing in the world. God is not looking for you to negotiate and suffer for him. That is no better than the lady that Pastor Victoria and I saw at the St. Peter's Basilica while we're taking pictures of this beautiful place. She crawled all the way from the front door on her knees, and, and you know it was hurting because that floor is marble, and she crawled all the way, and by, before she got, she was hurting. But you know what? She suffered for Jesus because her belief told her that if she did something sacrificial, like crawl on her knees for about 400 yards, that God was going to answer her prayer. God don't work that way. So, so I'm for fasting. But Daniel fast, this kind of fast, this kind of fast. Oh, ready for this one? I'm, gonna fa I'm not fasting food. I'm fasting the internet. 
that's got to be the most stupidest thing I've ever heard in my life. Now, if you say, if you teach it as, well, you don't have to fast food. You can fast the internet. Listen, if God tells you to fast the internet, shut your mouth and fast the internet. But don't you advertise it that you're fasting the internet. Well, you know, on these 21 days of fast, I feel like I need to eat because, you know, I get all dizzy when I eat. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull away from chocolate. It's stupid. You got it? Okay. I'm with you when it comes to the legalities of, like, the Daniel Fast. I yeah. come from a church that used to do the Daniel Fast the first mm -hmm. of the year. Um, the pastor wasn't very legalistic either. Um, but I will say that I have been a part of the overflow. And I, I don't know if it was the fats itself or just the people coming together being on one accord. You know, but I, we, I've m witnessed God do some mirac miraculous things. Yes. And the power and the anointing that took place during a fast because we were all in one accord. So for that reason... I'm in agreement with the, oh, if absolutely. you should say we should fast. Absolutely. So, you remember the Jesus fast that, um, the guy that does this? Lou Engel. The Lord spoke to him and said, tell the people, whoever can come with you to do a Jesus fast and fast for this amount of days. No food, just water. See, those are prophetic words of unity given by people who dare to join him for that. So those are spirit-led fasts. But to only do it every day, every first 21 days of the year, ritualistic? No. If we're doing it at this church, it's because Holy Spirit will tell me, do it. And it, whether it's those first 21 days or like, the, or like the 283rd day, starting for 21 days after that. And you're right. It's not necessarily the not eating of the food. What it is, is the spirit a faith in unity that it builds. And when we all come together as one person, heaven touches earth. Fasting helps you do that because it's an actual thing you can do. But man, I'm telling you, ask believers that have to be spirit-led fast. Spirit-led fast. Prophetic fast given. So yeah, there could be Daniel fast. If God told me, tell the church to do a Daniel fast. And you're going to do it with you. I'm like, God, are you serious? And I hear the Holy Spirit say it. I'm going to say, guys, this is what God told us to do. Whoever wants to do it, do it. But I really believe we all need to do it. But to say, well, you know, um, I don't like the damn fast. I, I, can I just do it? I don't want to, I, I don't want to eat veggies. I just want to only eat carnivore. So, and then they go, I'll do the fast. I mm, wonder how I look like after 21 days. Maybe I can drop a couple of sizes. <laughs> Anybody else? So this kind of, piggy this kind of piggybacks off of Pastor Laura's question. Um, so we talked about how uh, demons and fallen angels don't exactly look for influence over places. So can you kind of talk about the significance of praying over property lines and just properties in general? Yeah. It's like, silly. Like hedges of protection and all that stuff. Well, Bloodlines. Bloodlines. scripture talks about hedge of protection. It's symbolic as to what Job did. Job sacrificed in the Old Testament. He sacrificed for his family, and he prayed by sacrificing in the Old Testament and put a hedge of protection around his family. He was blessed. Job's obedience caused his family to walk in blessings. That's where we get the term hedge of protection. So we then take an Old Testament concept, we try to bring it into the New Testament, and we try to make it physical. Oh, in the name of Jesus, I pray over all the property lines here. A hedge of protection around the property line. Well, I guess when you leave the church property or your house, you're a free game for the devil. What do you do? Stay in your own property the whole time? That's a safe place. You, you, you see how 
And again, I know I get sarcastic sometimes, but guys, you have no idea how common sense is thrown out the window in a lot of charismatic Pentecostal circles. I got a better one. Lord, I pray that I hedge of protection around the world. In the name of Jesus, that case I can travel the world and always be safe. It's like praying before you eat. Who told y'all to do that? We're going to bless the food? You know you only do that when you're in a restaurant. You don't do that at home. Some people do. But why? Who told you, who told you to pray for the food? Food's dead. What do you do? Pray that it won't be bacteria? Here's one. Wash your hands. Why do you? The Bible never says to pray for the food. It says to give thanks. To give thanks because of your, your sustenance. Well, I do that every morning when I give thanks to the Lord. So you don't do grace? I do. When I drive by Publix, I say, Lord, I pray for the food in Publix and in Kroger and in Walmart, just in case my wife gets very creative, and I bless all that food, I can do it once a month, and I'm good. You see how silly it is? So praying over property lines, I don't know. If you get led by the Lord to do that, yeah, I, is it for protection, per se, or is that what... I mean, I've heard the property lines when, you know, people are trying to buy a piece of property. Oh, I'll walk a property now, but that's a physical property that I want to purchase. Oh, I walk on it, and I claim it. I'll do it. I like prayer walks because the city belongs to the kingdom of God. I'll do a prayer walk as a symbolic act. Not that I'm going to own the streets. Those, 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 those uh, easements belong to the government. I'm not going to own them. Technically, I do through our taxes. You get my point? The point is that we, so I'm not sure what you mean by property lines, because I've heard that prayer, but I've heard the prayer protection around our property. That's just, it's just silly. I've heard people pray over, over, um, um, Pastor Andy, what's that? Uh, over a, a, the, the prayer over the pets and the cleansing prayers. Oh, yeah. Yes. If, if, if cleansing prayers have to be the most dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life. What does that mean, a cleansing prayer? Why, you, you feel like if you minister to the Lord, you get dirty? You have to pray a cleansing prayer? What? What was that? What? Well, well, you did a lot of spiritual warfare. Now pray a cleansing prayer so none of it attaches to you. What? What, what Bible are we reading? I just, here's, here's a good one. Greater is he that lives in me than he that lives in the world. Done. No demons are going to attach themselves to me. Then Jesus, you know how many cleansing prayers Jesus had to pray? Oh, my goodness. It's just, find it in the Bible, and then we'll talk, but it's not in the Bible. Don't teach it. Yeah. Cleansing prayer, what? Here's one, cleanse your mind with the watering of God's word. Renew your mind constantly by praying a prayer like, oh, you didn't pray the prayer. Oh, demons are going to attack you at night. That has got to be, it's just superstition. It's silliness. We get so silly, we complicate things. And let's just keep it simple. Keep it the word of God. Keep it within God's word. Know how the enemy operates. And then attack him at, on his field. We, the church. The gates of hell will not prevail against the church. The gates of hell, we invade hell itself. We're bringing the kingdoms of our God, making them the kingdoms of this world. Did I mess you up? I'm sorry. Y'all good? Yeah. Got it? Are we good? Okay. So I guess my follow-up question would be, since the term hedge of protection is pre-cross, is that necessary moving forward? I mean, is it necessary? Since, we, since we're covered by Holy Spirit, it's drinking my own urine necessary. Don't do it? <laughs> is it necessary? <laughs> the answer to is necessary, there's this one line in a movie that says, is it necessary? Is it necessary that I drink my own urine? 
No, but it's thorough and I like the taste. No, but I do it anyway. No, is it necessary? <laughs> No, is it necessary? No, I don't believe it's necessary. But if you feel like it's necessary, then you better do it. You get my point? If you feel like it's necessary, you need to do it until you reach a place in your faith, and then you understand that it's not necessary. For example, if you think eating meat that has been offered to idols is bad, and you do it, then it's sin, because anything done outside of faith is sin. But until you mature and recognize that all things are permissible, but not all things are beneficial, and that you are free in Christ, whether a stake was offered to Satan or not, you know it's not going to affect you, then you're good. So in the meantime, if you need it, you better do it. But if you need to ask questions about it and research it later, then God will direct you to a greater truth. I'm not going to tell you what you need to do, whether it's necessary or not. At the same time. Just in turn, being covered by Holy Spirit. Let me ask you something. Do you need to be covered by someone who lives inside of you? No. Or, or, yeah. yeah. No. So, yeah. He lives in me. Yeah. Well, does he have to cover me too? No. Well, sorry, you lived in me. Well, I didn't cover you though. You get my point? No, I understand. I'm, I'm misusing language though. Uh, I, 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 I get what you mean because you didn't pray a prayer a covering a protection over you. Right. But find that in the Bible though. Okay. Find it in the Bible. I do pray, give us this day our daily bread, and lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. So that alone right there is a prayer of, of spiritual warfare. And the attacks of the enemy are now gone because I have aligned myself with the kingdom. And I'm walking under his covering, his authority, and I'm living in a, a spirit-filled life. You get my point? But you take out a book and, and, and say your spells and your rituals. And I said this, I said this, and this. I'm good. And you're no better than Harry Potter. Harry Potter. Anybody else? Yes. So you talked about um, like when people attach like, un, like faith. Um, when they copy other people in their, their acts of faith and they attach like the result or God's promise or the miracle to like the action rather than like the obedience and like what God said. Like you talked about pretty much doing unnecessary things, thinking that it's gonna work for us when it was really just like for those specific people. So would you kinda kind of I think it kind of borderlines or parallels. It looks like it starts to look like um, like sympathetic magic. Have you heard of that? Sympathetic magic? No, uh -huh. but you could, could you help me elaborate on it a yeah, little like, bit? Yeah, like, like, I, would you make that connection? Like, when you try to, um, when you try to make things happen in the spiritual by doing things in the natural, like with, like with voodoo or with prostitution to make Quite a baby or... interesting thought. Because I feel like it, it looks the same. It, 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 it kind of does, doesn't it? Yeah, and we get into our movement. When I mean by our movement, our charismatic Pentecostal movement, we get into some really weird, weird stuff. And that's what it almost appears to be like. It gets really spooky and weird when people all of a sudden start prophesying mates over each other. And, and it just gets crazy. It just gets crazy. And so... So yes, I, 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 I do agree with you. I agree with you, folks. It's super late. No one's moving. Um, is there any other questions? Any other questions? I don't want to stop the questions, but are there any other questions? John, one more. We'll take John's one more, and then we're done. I'll do an easy one. So was, so does, ex, does Egypt's, does Exodus's Egypt fit the um, description of a principality to you? Huh. Like a type, a type of principality? Yeah, like yeah. yeah, I would think so. I, I think it, you know, I think it can serve as a representation or what we call a type because remember, they, they left, Jacob and his family went to Egypt because 
remember Jacob and his family was really about, it could have been a few thousand people. Okay, that's how prosperous Jacob was. Okay, and his servants and, and all that, okay? And, and, and so when they moved to Egypt because they were starving to death, there was a famine in what we call the promised land. They had to go all the way down to Egypt where Joseph has saved food because he got that vision. They went into Egypt and they lived there until the famine was done and they decided to stay there and they were having a good time then Joseph dies and then the next Pharaoh dies and then they forgot everything that Joseph had done and they saw these people and figured let me enslave them so we can build the Egyptian empire even greater 400 years later so to answer your question yes I believe that is a, in a good example of a principality over the church, if Israel's going to be the church, of what, how he has people under subjection, and Moses becomes the type of Jesus. He was the first Messiah. Jesus was the second Messiah. Moses took them out of Egypt, and then from then on, the type, the type, the example of Egypt going through the wilderness and everything that happened there with the tabernacle, with the Ten Commandments and everything, and then crossing the Jordan with Jericho and everything, Israel has always been a type of the church, free from the hands of the enemy. Very good. The hardening of Pharaoh's heart? Could that be like something demonically, like it's a type of demonic? Uh, possibly, but remember, who hardened Pharaoh's heart? It was God. It wasn't the devil. So when I were getting into probably some, stepping into some waters, a party I don't need to be swimming in. But it's, it's good thinking, though. Guys, we're done. Let's all stand. Next week, guys, is going to be fire. Open doors. Some of y'all going to get happy. Some of y'all going to get upset. Father, bless us today. Lord, thank you. We receive your blessing, your spirit living in us. Father, to be demon slayers. Lord, thank you, Lord, that information is powerful, but even more revelation is supernatural. Thank you for the revelation you've given us. In Jesus' mighty name, amen.